from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the reading and book promotion arm for the library. Uh, we have the wonderful job of promoting books and reading uh, around the country and in Washington, D.C. as well. We have two national networks. State, there are affiliated state centers for the book that we work with in every state. And one of their jobs, of course, is to promote the writers of that state. And we also have a second network of nonprofit organizations that we work with uh, on literacy and related projects. Uh, the Center for the Book also plays a major role in the National Book Festival. And I can announce that uh, this year our dates are September 24th and 25th. It's the first time we've expa expanded to a second day. We're a little nervous about that, but uh, it's going to happen. And we hope it's a step towards a much broader and more year-round uh, project for the National Book Festival and for the Library of Congress. It's really the library's most uh, basic and I think in many ways important public event. Last year we had nearly 150,000 people on the mall, so it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. Uh, this series that you are joining us for is called Books and Beyond. Uh, it consists of new books by writers uh, who are, have a special connection with the Library of Congress, either through the book that's being featured or through past books. Uh, it is a way of us sharing the book that actually results from a lot of the research that people do, not just in the Library of Congress, but in other institutions. All of the Books and Beyond programs are taped for later broadcast on the library's website. Uh, we are pleased about this, but we also would like to explain to you a little bit about the format. Uh, Carla will speak for about 35 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, we're, we hope you have questions. We know that she has answers. But we do let you know that uh, if you decide to ask a question, you uh, risk becoming part of our webcast. And we thank you for the permission in advance. And all things electronic need to be turned off. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, Carla, uh, excuse me, I'm going to say a few words about Carla and her books. Uh, Carla Peterson received her PhD from Yale University and is a professor of English at the University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, she is the author, today we're learning about Black Gotham, a family history of African Americans in 19th century New York City. Uh, her, uh, she also is the author of a book called Doers of the Word, African American Women Speakers and Writers in the North, 1830 to 1980, which was published by Oxford University Press in 1995. I was explaining to her earlier that I looked up both of her books with my library background, of course, and I learned that at the Doer's book, which was really researched mostly at the Library of Congress, has no fewer than 13 Library of Congress subject headings. Now, this is really quite remarkable for someone who's spent a lot of time looking at these headings as listed in our bibliographic data. It means that uh, she covered such a broad scope in that book that our subject catalogers didn't know quite what to do with it. So it, on the other hand, it shows the broad range that Carla has, is capable of by focusing, as she does in the book she's going to talk about today, in this case, on a specific subject. Uh, this is a personal book for her, as she will explain. Uh, it's based on her own family. And she has reorganized this particular talk for this audience to talk about her family and the records that she used uh, in a very special way. As you go out after the book signing, the book signing will start at about 1 o'clock. And we will, uh, you may be, be able to purchase books here at the Library of Congress discount. Uh, we also have a schedule of future Center for the Book events available for you. And I want to remind you that we also have a page on Facebook, a Books and Beyond Book Club, where you not only can 
comment about past uh, talks here, but also uh, add your comments about the wonderful job that I know Carla is going to do. It is now my pleasure to introduce our author, uh, Carla Peterson from the University of Maryland. Carla. So now I really have to perform, right? <laughs> I mean, he set me up. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And as you can tell, this book is um, mainly about New York. And so a lot of the research I did was in New York. But John was absolutely right in saying that my first two books were researched here very heavily. Um, I almost lived here uh, while doing both of those books, and my kids were very young then, and my husband would drop them off, drop me off at the library, and then take them out for the day, and they started saying, oh, mom's going to her sanctuary. <laughs> um, so that is really the way I feel about the library, and I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so I'm going to start with two quotes, and which I think really explain what I'm trying to do, what the project of the book is about. Um, and then talk about the book more generally. Um, the first quote is, both my quotes are from the prologue, and the first one is my own prose. We still hold certain truths about African Americans to be self-evident, that the phrase 19th century black Americans refers to enslaved people, that New York State before the Civil War denotes a place of freedom, that blacks in New York City designates Harlem, that the black community posits a classless and culturally unified society, that a black elite did not exist until well into the 20th century. The lives of my New York forebears belie such assumptions. They were born free at a time when slavery was still legal in New York State. They lived in racially mixed neighborhoods, first in Lower Manhattan and then after the Civil War in Brooklyn, at a time when Harlem was a mere village. They were part of New York's small but significant black community, and specifically its elite class. So from this quote, you can see that what I'm trying to do is challenge and maybe overturn many assumptions that we have about 19th century black Americans to really focus, as I did in Doers of the Word, on the free black communities in the urban north. Um, the second quote is from Toni Morrison's Beloved, and it is the epigraph of the prologue, and it might be familiar to many of you here. Denver was seeing it now and feeling it through Beloved, and the more fine points she made, the more detail she provided, the more Beloved liked it. So she anticipated the questions by giving blood to the scraps her mother and grandmother told her, and a heartbeat. Denver spoke. Beloved listened, and the two did the best they could to create what really happened, how it really was, something only Seth knew because she alone had the mind for it and the time afterward to shape it. So when I was rereading Beloved and came across that quote, it <clears throat> really struck me that what I was trying to do was something very similar to what Denver was trying to do, taking the memories of others, not my memory, but the memories of my 19th century forebears and trying to recreate their lives and to put what um, Morrison's um, uh, narrator says, to put blood and a heartbeat on the scraps of memory that have been left. And that's really the project um, that I set out to do. So uh, my desire to do this was to say the least foolhardy because I started with one name and one story attached to that name, and the story turned out to be half right, half wrong. So the name is that of Philip Augustus White, and he is my great-great-grandfather, great-grandfather. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Interruption. <laughs> I have a family tree. People say that this gets, um, yeah, that this, uh, What? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, okay, that um, 
Uh, so I'm f sorry for the interruption, but this is my family tree. The first time I gave this talk, people, I didn't have a family tree, and people complained how um, complicated my family was. All families are complicated, right? Uh, and so what I'm providing here um, is the first three or four generations. And actually, I'm only, given the way I've structured this talk, I'm only going to be talking about a couple of the generations, but this gives you a sense. So kind of right in the middle is Philip Augustus White, um, and he was my great-grandfather, and that was, he is the, the one name I had. So the story about him was that he was born in Haiti, and his name was uh, Philippe Auguste Blanc, that at the time of the Haitian Revolution, he emigrated to Paris, uh, became a pharmacist, then went to this, came to the States, to New York, and anglicized his name to Philip Augustus White. Well, the true part of this story was New York, Philip Augustus White, and pharmacy. But the Haiti and the uh, Paris, not so much. So um, we can talk later about how we romanticize family histories, and I think that was a romanticization. So I went up to New York with that, um, with that information, um, and that's all I had. I had no other family stories and documents. So I started to do research in the archives, and of course I did a lot, a lot of research in the archives in New York City um, at the Schomburg, at the uh, New York uh, Historical Society, and at um, the New York Public Library. And the first thing that I discovered was that my fam unlike what happened in my family, where there was so much forgetting of the family history, that at least in the 19th century, there had been a real will to preserve. Um, black New Yorkers in the 19th century were so aware of their own history, of what they were doing, and so desirous of preserving it, of commemorating it and preserving it. But as with all underfunded communities, there's a lack of resources. Uh, how do you preserve when you don't have much money? Um, and what I found out was pres preservation went uh, for example, in the form of rituals. So the abolition of the slave trade happened January 1, 1808, and there would be ceremonies every year, January 1, to commemorate that. When New York State finally abolished slavery in 1827, July 4th, there were annual ceremonies to commemorate that. There were attempts to uh, create monuments uh, to honor the dead, um, never enough money to really pull that off. And then there were newspapers, um, and the desire then to preserve, to record in writing the history of the 19th century. Um, so that in my book, I decided to take advantage of what could appear to be a disadvantage, um, a lack of material, and to talk about the way in which I went about researching what I found, what I didn't find, and what I could make of both the findings and the non-findings. So the book unfolds on two levels. On the first level, it is that my search to find, and on the second level, it's the history itself. So I want to start um, with my first find, this was at the Schomburg, and I was going through a collection, uh, the Rhoda Golden Freeman collection. She'd written a book titled The Free New York, The Free Negro in Antebellum New York City, and then had left her papers uh, with the Schomburg. And um, if, all, if any of you remember our pre-internet days, there were 12 shoe boxes, right, with those eight, five by eight note cards. Yeah, I see a lot of nodding. Um, and in box, I think, number eight, uh, titled Biography, I came across this. And this is the um, obituary. It's, it's a, torn from a scrapbook. Um, and it is the obituary page of my great-grandfather, Philip Augustus White. So you see his photo, and that's, that's the, his picture, and that's the um, obituary. And then pasted next to it were poems that I soon discovered dealt with um, many of the passions of his life, many of his avocations. So just a brief um, thumbnail sketch. He was born in 1823. Um, uh, he had a British father, English father, a um, Jamaican mother, I don't know anything about where they met, whether they were actually married or not. I have no, none of that biographical information. 
The father died when Philip was young. The family was impoverished. But gradually, um, my great-grandfather made his way up um, and went to apprentice um, in the pharmacy of James McCune Smith. That name might be familiar to some of, some of you. He was one of our early pharmacists and doctors and then set up his own pharmacy um, and quit, made quite a lot of money. And uh, what he made, he gave back to two passions, one, the uh, black education, and the other, St. Philip's Episcopal Church. So um, having made this find and feeling so delighted, I decided to be really careful and go through the box very carefully. And this is the next find that I made, and this is my great-great-grandfather, Peter Guignon. I had no idea who he was while I was, uh, when I saw the page, uh, but I started to read the print, and it said that his daughter, um, uh, Elizabeth, married Philip White. So I knew that this was a son-in-law, father-in-law relationship. Um, now, his parents came from the West Indies, so, and from Haiti, so that might have been the Haitian part of my family story. Um, he was born in New York, uh, went to school, and I'll come back to that later, uh, with young men who really became the dominant leaders of New York, of black New York, and really of, of, of black society in general in the um, pre-Civil War years. And he, too, became a pharmacist, not by apprenticeship or schooling, but by marrying into a family um, that, had, uh, that owned a pharmacy. So um, I... I ended up thinking in a way of my book as a scrapbook. So if you remember in my quote from Toni Morrison, um, what the narrator says is that Denver takes the scraps of memory left to her by her, given to her by her mother to try and figure out what it was really was, okay, what her history really was. And these were elements from, um, these are pages torn from a scrapbook. I don't know who the scrapbook owner was. So the idea of the scrapbook then became very compelling to me, um, and I invite the reader at the end of the prologue to read my book as a scrapbook, um, where you will, there are certain things that I found that I put in, other things that I didn't. It's not really a continuous narrative, but it is sort of continuous. It is chronological, um, and I start with um, my great-great-grandfather, this man, and I end with the death of my great-grandfather, Philip Augustus White, in um, 1891. So the book really spans the entire century. Um, what I'm at pains to show is how cyclical the history of black New Yorkers was. Their struggle and advance, and then all of a sudden something happens to slap them down. Um, the 1834 uh, draft riot. Then they struggle again and rise. And then there's this intense, intense um, rise of scientific racism in the 1850s. It's not just in the South, it's very much in New York. That slaps them down again. Then they rise again in the late 1850s, and then the draft riots happen. Um, the other thing that I also emphasize is that um, I think of this as a spatial history. Um, and that where they lived uh, was very important, and how they organized themselves spatially was really important. Hence the title of the book, Black Gotham. Uh, it's not named after my great-great-grandfather or my great-grandfather, but the city in, where, in which they lived. So um, I'm going to be kind of organizing my talk around that as then I talk about some of the finds that I made. So at the end of the prologue, I talk about how um, this um, group of black New Yorkers, what I call a black elite, uh, lived um, in what I called five concentric circles. So the first one was the elite itself, this kind of small social circle, what Alexander Crummel called the wide circle of the leading citizens of New York and vicinity. Um, the second, I'm just going to name them and then come back to some others. The second is the black community, and that's really the institutions around which blacks uh, congregated um, and that brought them together and kept them going. And uh, uh, the institutions were a little bit spread out all over, but those were kind of the nodal points of black life. Uh, just to give you some numbers, in 1840, there are 16,400 African Americans in New York out of about 313,000. So you see how small the community was. 
And then the numbers dipped so that right before the Civil War, um, you, in 1860, there are 12,500 out of eight, 814,000. Um, the next point is that blacks live all over the city. They're in pockets, but they, they're in almost every single ward in New York City. Um, and so we can't think of black New Yorkers living in a place like Har Harlem, right? Or, or Harlem of the, of the mid 20th century, which we really thought as a black neighborhood where people lived, where they worked, where their churches were and so forth. Um, beyond that, there was, of course, contact. So my fourth circle is contact beyond uh, New York in different cities, Philadelphia, uh, Boston, and so forth. And then finally, the last circle is that of the cosmos, because they really thought of themselves as cosmopolitan, as having a very broad global perspective uh, on themselves and on the world. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about some of these um, circles, and I'm going to focus on newspapers. And so what I said to John earlier on is that I really think of newspapers, 19th century African-American newspapers, as the books of the period. Um, blacks were not publishing books to the extent they were like the slave narratives. Those were given over to white abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, and they published books. But for African Americans in the 19th century, publication was, in, was the newspaper. And it's really interesting to think that I could give two examples. With the very earliest newspaper, Freedom's Journal, um, the editors gave the, those papers to the library of the school I'm, I'm about to talk, uh, talk about, so uh, which, as we would today, give li books to libraries, right? Um, if the DC Public Library you know, wants stuff, we give them books, we don't give them newspapers, but they gave newspapers. And then there's another um, uh, newspaper or magazine, the Anglo-African Magazine, which in 1859, ran for a year in 1859, and then was collected as a book, and the Library of ha Congress indeed has a copy um, of that book. So I wanna start um, with uh, the talking about the elite a little bit. Um, and this is the uh, Mulberry Street School. So this is the school that my great-great-grandfather, um, Peter Guignon, went to, along with some very famous men, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the names, James McCune Smith, Alexander Crummel, Henry Highland Garnett, uh, the two Reason brothers, Patrick and Charles Reason, uh, and George Downing, and many um, others. And I know that uh, my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather went to school with them, and uh, I know that they were all there together because this obituary written by Alexander Crummel gives me that information. So this is from the newspaper, from the New York Freeman, um, and it's, uh, so my great-great-grandfather died in 1885. So the value get then of the newspaper and of the obituary in commemorating and giving me this really, really important fact that these young men went to school together. And I really think it was a question of strength in numbers um, that allowed so many of them uh, to become leaders uh, of, of black New York and of black society at large. Um, so, the, the other thing I want to stress is the real importance of education. Um, it, all throughout the century, it was education, education, education. And education meant something that, like what we would today call uh, a liberal arts education. Uh, really, knowledge of the world, of history, of literature, um, of the natural sciences, um, and so forth. Uh, it was also education in character, the development of moral character. It's education in respectability, knowing how to behave. Um, it was education on how to make money, because this is New York, and then as now, making money was like a prime value in New York City. And finally, it was education in cosmopolitanism, the insistence that uh, beyond the local, um, the little neighborhoods of New York, there was a world out there that blacks had come from, in fact, um, and that they, uh, where they also had roots and should know about. Um, so the next, um, 
the uh, next thing that I want to talk about, the next concentric circle, is the black community. And I'm going to just focus on a couple of institutions. Uh, and one is the Philomathian Society, which was a literary society. And uh, it was founded early on, the origins are murky, but there was a revival of this um, society in the 1830s, which was spearheaded uh, by my great-great-grandfather, Peter Guignon. So this is a case of just cranking through microfilm here at the Library of, of Congress and elsewhere and going through and just, in this case, it was the Colored American. Uh, the newspaper called them Colored American and just going through and looking and looking. And then I came across the name, my great-great-grandfather, and I said, well, what is this? So he had helped to revive the Philomathian Society, uh, which encouraged young men of New York to come together uh, to read, to discuss readings, um, and um, so forth. So the, one of the members is Charles Reason, and he later became a professor of literature um, in a small college in upstate New York. And um, he wrote a poem, uh, The Spirit Voice or Liberty Call to the Disfranchised. He actually call, uh, wrote many poems. So I'm just going to quote a little bit, a couple of lines, and you can tell me later whether you think that he's a good poet or not. So. Um, the, and, and it's an interesting poem, and it, it, it's kind of pretty typical because it shows how uh, black um, leaders of the period brought together both their literary sensibility and their political aspirations. So the right to vote had been taken away from black men in 1825 and um, 1821, and they want it back. So that's why it's called. Uh, this, uh, this spirit voice or liberty call to the disfranchised. They've been disfranchised. So he says, uh, "'Tis calling you who now too long have been sore victims suffering under legal sin, to vow no more to sleep till raised and freed from partial bondage to a life indeed." So that is some of his verse. Um, the Another very prominent uh, uh, speaker in this in, um, um, at the um, Philomathian Society is James McCune Smith, uh, a man who did everything. So he was a pharmacist, he was a doctor, he was a statistician, he was a poet, he was an essayist. Um, he did really everything. And had he lived beyond 1865, I think he would have outshone Frederick Douglass um, in our canon. Um, so he wrote so many essays, and I'll just mention one, uh, The Destiny of Our People. And what he's trying to do in that um, article is find a place for, a, it's a call to African Americans, a definition of who we are and where we must go. And so he does two things. He emphasizes the universality of African Americans. We are humans like all others, but also then talks about our particularity, what our special destiny is. And his argument is that um, white America has become so corrupt, is no longer abiding by the values of the Declaration of Independence or of, um, uh, of the Constitution, that it is up to black Americans to what he calls purify the nation. Um, so those are two quick examples. Um, other than the Philomathian Society, um, black uh, New Yorkers became, black men became very interested in uh, Freemasonry and odd fellowship. And uh, this is something then that brought together black men in these kind of secret societies. And uh, many of the people, all the men I've listed, were members of either one or the other and took it all very seriously. So the question is, where does that leave black women? And so one of my great finds was here at the Library of Congress in Frederick Douglass's paper. Um, and the, the, if you really want to do your research properly, you have to go to all the archives, all the libraries you can find, because what they have is, um, the libraries have many of the same issues, but not always. So it was at the Library of Congress that I found this one issue that I don't think exists anywhere else. And it's a, a woman writes in, she's writing under a pseudonym, and she calls herself Charlotte Kay. Um, and she talks about how black women are left out of all this activity that's going on. And I'll just read it really quickly. 
Um, there had been two literary societies in active operation, so this is in the earlier years, giving public lectures debates to which we women folks were admitted. So that's the Philomathian Society, and I think the other is the Phoenixonian. I can assure you these were pleasant times. Our bows gallanted us to and from the meetings, at one of which I became acquainted with my first husband. And our social circle, especially at tea parties on Sunday evenings, felt the impulse and the culture which flowed from the eloquent and earnest discussion. So then she talks about how Odd Fellows and Freemason comes along. These societies disappear, and by the early 1840s, the literary societies are even, are indeed gone, and that there's very little place for black women. And this is in fact true, and this is one of the puzzles that I um, was confronted with and never entirely resolved, because black women are present um, in the archives in Philadelphia and in Boston, mainly in connection with anti-slavery societies. They're there in a way that black women in New York aren't. And I think that, well, what do I think? Uh, two things, one, black men were interested in two particular areas of activity that left out women. One was making money, entrepreneurship, and the other was the restitution of the vote that had been taken away in 1821. Um, the other was that anti-slavery was activity was never as intense in New York City as it was in Philadelphia and Boston. And that's where so many of the black women in those two cities were active. Um, okay, so um, I want to move on to the draft riots and give a quick example of um, how place mattered uh, so much in, uh, uh, in New York City. And I came across, again, using the newspapers, an article in the New York Tri Daily Tribune, um, and it goes as follows. Uh, and so I was, I was looking for documentation about the, um, the draft riots and again, scrolling new, uh, through newspapers. Police headquarters observed a, a, a July 23, 23 Tribune report looks more like an arsenal than the great rendezvous of our metropolitan force. United States soldiers and volunteers, regular, regular uh, and special uh, special policemen stand at the corners of the streets that bound the edifice and the African church in front of its swarms uh, of its swarms with soldiers. So I wondered what was the African church that they were talking about and went to the archives and looked and discovered that it was my family's church, St. Philip's Episcopal Church. So the story here is that the church was laid directly, stood directly across from police headquarters. That's police headquarters. So just imagine it on the other side of the street. Um, and that the police um, occupied the church as a barracks during the Jaft riots in that horrendous week of July um, 1863. So the church was not demolished, but it was desecrated. Um, the police left it in a total mess. And there's, if you follow the trail in particular um, in the St. Philip's Vestry Minutes, it takes until 1871 to settle the case and for the church to get reparations. And they get half of what they asked for. Um, but in the book, I talk about how monetary reparations is just a small amount, that there was also uh, the need for spiritual reparations, for psychical reparations as well. And maybe to this day that hasn't even happened. Um, okay, I then want to move over in my last remaining minutes um, to Brooklyn. Um, and I will talk a little bit about women because here is where women finally come to the fore. This is Maritza Lyons, so she's on my family tree. She's my great grand aunt. And a lot of the information I have, um, I had about my family came from a manuscript that she left at the um, Schomburg. It's an 85 type script um, uh, manuscript where she talks about her life and her, uh, this whole 19th century period. So much of the, her manuscript is about what the men, her father was Albro Lyons, what the men in the community did. 
Uh, but then she comes to herself, and there's, um, in the 1880s and 1890s is when we first start to see the presence of um, black women. So um, the first thing that I found, and again, going through the newspapers, and I went through the news, black newspapers of the time, that's the New York Globe, the Freeman, and the Age. So these were T. Thomas Fortune's newspapers, and it was the same newspaper that just changed names. And he talks about um, uh, two societies, the New York's Bethel Literary Association and the Brooklyn Literary Union that were really engaged in race work at the time. So the elite in this period, this post-Civil War period, had really become quite moneyed and were living very well. And they were being attacked in the black press as being too ostentatious and ignoring their own. And they were often referred to as whitewashed blacks. So I'm not denying that they didn't live well and gave great parties with great food and dressed really well. But I want to emphasize that in these associations, these two um, literary societies, they were in fact also engaged in the very hard job of doing race work um, in this postbellum period in the, 1870s, the 1880s and the 1890s. And this is the first time where women are part of the lectures and the debates. So they weren't there in the Philomathian Society. Charlotte Kay complained, but here they are, and my great grand aunt Maricha um, is one of them. Um, and so she uh, is a school teacher. Um, she teaches school in Brooklyn Elementary School. She also is responsible for helping to found one of the black women's club of the period called the Woman's Loyal Union. And she does it um, because Ida B. Wells, I'm sure you, many of you recognize the photo, um, comes to town after she's driven out of Tennessee, of Memphis, uh, because of that lynching incident. And she's embraced by the black women of, um, uh, of Brooklyn. And uh, she looks around and after a while she says, you Brooklyn women could be doing more. So she encourages them to, um, uh, to uh, start a club, and that's the Women's Loyal Union. And they really follow in Ida B. Wells' footsteps. Um, one of the things Ida wanted to do in uh, her lynching was, an uh, anti-lynching campaign, was to really um, uh, give out accurate information what was going on. So these women uh, compiled a questionnaire uh, of, um, uh, and sent it out to many different places asking for, uh, uh, questions about the status of black Americans nationwide. Um, and they also engaged in lobbying uh, with Congress and so forth. The last thing they did was, and this was a real surprise to me, and again, I got this through the newspapers, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, was they became part of a group called the um, King's Daughters, which had been a group founded by white women in the 1880s in uh, New York City. And the idea was that women who had time and money should get together and form little circles of 10 women and then come together and do charitable work. And these women of New York, one of the charitable works they took up was taking care, uh, rehabilitating um, a Brook an African-American home for the aged in Brooklyn. And as I continued in my research, scrolling through, what I saw was that black women had founded their own circles under the aegis of the king's daughter, something that I just didn't expect. Um, and before I knew it, the two groups, the white circle and the black circle, were collaborating together on the same enterprise. And the black women were even, even serving on the board of managers with white women. And this would not have happened, say, with the Colored Orphan Asylum um, in New York in the 1840s, 50s, 60s. So that was, to me, a very new development in uh, interracial, uh, women's interracial um, activity. Um, so I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop here. And I'll just leave you with um, the thought that I told you why I came to write this book, but I want to add that one thing to it 
is that I want to, the book in a way is to is encourage other stories. So I only scratch the surface and one could go on and do more and find out more stories about James McCune Smith, uh, George Downing, um, uh, Alexander Crummel or whatever. But um, also I'm sure many of you have stories and I've been meeting people with unbelievable stories to tell about their family background. So I just want, I, this is, the book is simply planting a seed to encourage the making of other stories so that eventually as the decades go on, we'll have not just one little story of my family, but a much bigger national story about um, black American history. Thank you. So I'd be happy to take questions. Yes. Yes. Okay. And Cornelia Bright is the family of all connections, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, um, so the question was looking at the family sh uh, tree is Jer Jerome Bowers Peterson, my grandfather, and he is. And he married Cornelia Steele White, who was Philip Augustus White's um, daughter. And um, so my next project could possibly be. Um, a biography or of Jerome Bowers Peterson. He was the co-editor with T. Thomas Fortune of the New York Age. Um, and he was also one of the um, black appointments of, by the Republican administration. And so you all know of uh, James Weldon Johnson uh, and his appointments. And um, my uh, grandfather, Jerome Bowers Peterson, uh, served as a tax collector in Puerto Rico and also in Venezuela. He was in Venezuela before um, James Weldon Johnson. So he could be an interesting person to write about. Um, yes. So the question is whether I got any um, family stories from my grandmother. My grandmother died in the 1920s. I mean, from your, your mother. That would be my father, via my father. So whether, whether any family stories from the level of my, uh, of my grandparents got passed down, and the answer is no. And I speculate on the reasons why in the prologue of my book. And I think that the reasons were uh, part sociological and part very, very personal. So on the level of, so, well, I'll start with the personal. Um, when, they, when my uh, grandfather was in Puerto Rico as um, this Republican appoint, uh, appointee, uh, the three children were there. So my, grandfa my father had two older, a, a, a brother and a sister. And apparently they all went to the beach one day, just the three kids alone. And uh, they were swimming and a big undertow came. And my, my aunt, Dorothy Peterson, went and rescued my father, who was little, who was maybe three or four at the time, figuring out that her older brother, Philip, um, would be able to take care of himself and swim to safety. And when she turned around, he was gone. And the body was never recovered. And the story that I heard was that they blamed each other. So my, my grandmother blamed Dorothy for having let Philip die. Um, and Dorothy blamed um, her mother for having left them unattended and the whole burden on, on her. Um, whatever you know, the truth or not truth of, of this story, I mean, he did die, so that part was true. Um, my aunt really did not like her mother. There was a really, there was a breach between them. And when my oldest sister asked my aunt, so she died in the 1970s, so we had plenty of time, although we, I, we weren't asking the right questions about our family. You don't think of doing it until it's too late. Uh, but uh, when my, sis, my oldest sister asked um, our aunt Dorothy, she, for a photograph, um, and I have one in the book, um, of her mother, my aunt apparently walked into her bedroom and came out and said, here, you can have this. 
and my sister looked at it, and it was a photograph of um, Cornelia Steele White's tomb, her tomb. Um, and so my, my aunt had tremendous sway over my father. They were very, very close. And he and my aunt really broke with her family, and she moved up to Harlem, and she was a, a fringe member of the Harlem Renaissance. I mean, but she knew Nella Larson, Langston Hughes, Carl Van Vichten, et cetera, et cetera. And she pulled her little brother along, and they just turned their back on the 19th century. And so that's the kind of more sociological part, the desire to be modern, you know, to be new Negroes, and not all this old-fashioned 19th century stuff with Episcopal Church and propriety and respectability. Um, so I think that that's, so my family really um, made a quite abrupt cut, I think, in, at that generation with the past, of the, the family past, yeah. Yes? Did you see any overlap with the Lane family of New York? So the question was whether I saw any overlap with the Delaney family of New York. Uh, no, because I think that would be a 20th century story, right? And I really, I'm a 19th century person, and I don't do anything beyond 1903, which is the publication of The Souls of Black Folk. Um, so no, um, I didn't, although uh, my mother was a doctor uh, and went to, um, both my parents were doctors and went to Columbia Medical School, and they did know the Delaney's, yeah, yeah. But that would be another story. And the story of blacks in medicine would be absolutely fascinating to do, starting with James McCune Smith and then a photo I didn't show of one of the women who helped to found the Women's Loyal Union and was part of that circle, one of the um, King's Daughters circles, um, helping on the Zion Home for the Aged, is Susan, um, I gotta get the, McKinney Stewart. She's an, she's an early black African-American doctor. So that would be a fascinating study. Yes? You know, I would like to thank you for an extremely insightful CICEN SICEN. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that you're related to the Wigglesons and a Freemasonry. And that is absolutely fascinating. And we recently acquired that Microsoft collection that Chandler has recently. Oh, yes. Now. Yes. So Mary Joseph Marsh, oh, so the question was um, uh, addressing, if you look at the fa on the family tree, uh, the Williamson, um, Harry Albro Williamson, who was a Freemason and wrote extensively about Freemasonry. And the fact that, um, so that was what the question was. Um, yeah. Um, and so you're saying Mary Joseph Marshall was, Oh, Mary Elizabeth Pauline Lyons, yeah. She was. And her paper, part of her papers, her Easter star papers are with this paper. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. great. So there was a small fraction of Mary Elizabeth Pauline Lyons. Right. Well, good. yeah, yeah. I could do a lot more um, with that. So because you've acquired that, that microfilm, uh, Maricha Lyons. Uh, 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 then her her autobiography w is in there too, um, and it's titled "Memories of Yesterdays," um, and it's absolutely fascinating. And I could not have done without that. Yes. Were you able to trace the businesses, the wealth of your family from there up to now? Um, not up to now, but there were records. Um, uh, in the 19th century. So um, there was a book, um, uh, or there was, through the census, you can figure out wealth of, um, of, of people at the time. And one of the th things that they did, so I'm talking about James McCune Smith, George Downing, um, Philip White, and so forth. Uh, other than having businesses, they also went and acquired real estate. So in that sense, again, they were just like 
you know, other New Yorkers, we know that wealth lies in the very land of Gotham, right? And so let's buy as, as much as we can. Um, I'll just mention one person who uh, became truly wealthy, um, which is George Downing, and I didn't show his photo. Um, this is George Downing. So his father, um, Thomas Downing, had an oyster cellar in Lower Manhattan, which was very well known and patronized by all kinds of people. And he sent Queen Victoria a basket of oysters, and uh, Dickens went there, and so forth and so on. And, that's, and then the son opened a catering store on Broadway, and then he moved to uh, Newport, Rhode Island and um, established a hotel. And to read the description of the hotel, it is, um, you know, it's beyond the four seasons today. It's just really. So, um, but then what happens in the 20th century with the wealth, um, I'm really not sure. And I've had a really, really hard time finding descendants. Um, and I've put out, you know, uh, calls for descendants. And it's been really difficult. We have time for one more question, Carla. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the Women's Loyal Union lobbying, uh, some of their efforts were to lobby Congress, and it was in particular in the field of education and um, the Blair Bill. Yeah, 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 the Blair Bill, yeah, yeah. Well, I would like to thank Carla so much for a wonderful talk. Not only was educational, it was personal. It Genealogically speaking, we learned a lot. Insightful. Insightful, <laughs> thank you. See, you came prepared with your own clothes, too. I knew that. <laughs> but we now are going to move to a book signing, and we're going to put Carla at the table over here. And we have still have some books for sale, and we can continue to tell stories and learn more about her wonderful family in a personal way. Let's give her one final round of applause. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.